Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. Not a day seems to go by without some news story or other about childhood anxiety, talking about the anxious generation. Last year, the American Surgeon General came out suggesting that there was a teen mental health crisis because of social media. Often social media is blamed, uh, but it's not just social media. Washington Post reported late last year that it's not just teens, but young adults are suffering from anxiety and, of course, children. And the question is why? My guest today is given a great deal of thought, indeed, in some ways, his whole career to thinking about why children are anxious, how they suffer, and how to make this tragic situation better. Mark Hauser is a writer, biologist, neuroscientist, uh, and also he's a, a global um, activist when it comes to childhood mental health. And he's the author of an interesting new book. He's authored many books, but he has a new book out. It's called, appropriately enough, Vulnerable Minds, The Harm of Childhood Trauma and the Hope of Resilience. And he's joining us from Cape Cod in Massachusetts today. Mark, um, you're involved on the ground in terms of the, the suffering of, of children, of, of childhood traumas, but you're also um, an evolutionary biologist. Is there something different today about childhood trauma, or is this a constant, do you think, throughout human history? I think it's a constant throughout human history, and I would go further and say that it's part of um, our evolutionary past and that we can see in other animals various kinds of adversity that impact the development of young infants in our closest living relatives like the primates. There's some coming out of Kenya uh, on baboons um, that has looked at very, much of the same kinds of issues that have for in our scientific work in children um, that is looking at things like poverty, in the case of baboons, of course, it's lack of resources. Um, bad mothering or, uh, towards infants, um, droughts and things like that, that can really, really impact the biology and development of primates. And so we are part of the primate lineage. And so it affects us as well. What I would say, though, and we'll get into this, is childhood adversity is nothing new uh, in human evolution. Um, but as we have evolved culturally, we've added in some dimensions um, that has made it difficult for children in addition to the ones that are more urgent. Mark, previous generations of scholars or certainly previous civilizations thought of children coming into the world fully formed. Your book, of course, by definition, Vulnerable Minds, suggests that Lockean notion of a tabula rasa, that we're coming ill-formed and that we're shaped by our experience. Um, are you a, a, a Lockean, a pure Lockean in your analysis that we come with nothing, we're pure empty slates and we take on the experience that we are lucky or unlucky enough to have in, in our living uh, experiences? No, I'm probably on the opposite end of the spectrum. I, I put a lot into our biology, um, both in terms of um, whether a child is born more on the vulnerable end or more on the resilient end. I think a lot of that has to do with our biology. And then how our experiences shape that can either push us more towards the vulnerable end or push us more towards the real resilient end. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about the power of the biology to, in some ways, channel how the experiences are taken on board. So um, in you know some of my earlier work, um, work that I published with the linguist Noam Chomsky, I adhere you know, strongly to the idea that we have this kind of innate um, capacity to acquire language 
So it's a bi-velocity that channels the experience. And I made similar arguments uh, in my book, Moral Minds, about the moral sphere. Um, so I think we start with some very significant biological constraints um, that shape development. Um, and, and that, as we now are learning more and more from the sciences, shows that some children start life off much more vulnerable to certain kinds of experiences and others are born with much more resilience, able to bounce back from the same kind of adversity. The subtitle of, of the new book, Mark, um, is uh, The Harm of Childhood Trauma and the Hope of Resilience. How do you quantify childhood? We've done some shows recently with hmm. authors who suggest that childhood is becoming longer and longer and more and more so-called kids, quote unquote, in their late 20s, even early 30s, are coming home for one reason or other, economic, um, psychological, to live with their parents. How, in your view, is the concept of childhood, has that changed historically? Uh, are, are young people experiencing longer childhoods in the 21st century? So I think that's a, first of all, I think it's a really great question. Um, and it in some ways frames um, some of the discussion in my book, um, because for example, a famous and important paper uh, that was published in the late nineties by a doctor, Dr. Vincent Felitti and his colleagues um, was the first one on the map, this idea of adverse childhood experiences, which goes by the acronym of ACEs. And for them, childhood was defined as birth to 18. Um, and I think one of the things that's changed our understanding of what constitutes childhood um, is the, the, the really growing and pretty monumental evidence in the neurosciences that's looked at how certain parts of the brain um, continue to develop and mature far later than 18. Um, and this has had pretty massive ramifications on legal issues, criminal issues, uh, and treatment issues. So for example, um, the frontal area of the brain, the frontal lobe, is an area that really doesn't fully mature until the age of about 23 to 25. Are, you know, out of college, um, and that system is not fully mature. And that, um, for example, in the United States has played a huge role in changing the age of criminal convictions. Uh, recently in my own state of Massachusetts, um, it made a massive change in the legality of life without parole. Now, if you commit a crime uh, in Massachusetts, unless you're more than 21, you cannot get life without parole. And that was shifted from the age of 18. And that was based on a thinking about um, childhood and, and brain development in particular. So I don't think necessarily that childhood per se has changed, although our thinking about what counts has changed in part because of these developments in the neurosciences. Um, I would add another piece, um, and this is, you know, plays a big role in my book. Um, a lot of people's thinking um, around uh, trauma um, and adversity um, has been looked at from a pretty Western view um, of adversity, um, including things like neglect and violence and so forth. Um, and yet it's very important that in certain societies, children are exposed to experiences um, that are required of when cultures think of being more mature. So think of countries ongoing today where children are child soldiers. Um, when I was living in Uganda, there were children who were sh soldiers, uh, really young kids, 15, 16 or so. And of course it can be earlier. In many parts of the world, uh, children are being kind of married off at a very young age. So when we think about this notion of adversity, and the potential trauma that comes from it, we need to think about development in light of cultural differences as well. And there's a very strong tendency for many things that have been written about trauma and adversity to have a very Western lens on the problem. Yeah, it's very controversial, Mark, as you know this better than I do, to talk about 
Western concepts of, of violence. I'm not sure you know a lot, obviously, a lot more about this than I do, that some cultures are more open to child soldiers. It, it brings to mind um, Lord of the Rings and the <laughs> supposedly, at least perhaps from reading that book, the innate violence and bullying of, of children. Do you believe um, in the idea of, of, of innocence of the child? Is this the the moral foundations of, of the book and indeed of your work? Is there such a thing as innocence in your mind? I, I think it really depends. I think, you know, when we start thinking about violence and the consequence and the legality of, of it, um, a lot obviously bears on the of intent, right? And so when we think about, did a child do something innocently, in some ways not knowingly, um, do they have the capacity to control what they do? That's a very complicated story, but I think a really interesting one. And so let me bring it back in the following way. Um, in our my own country, the United States, there are 19 states where corporal punishment, meaning hitting children in schools, is legal. That's my own country, right? So even if I talk about my own country as a culture, massive variation within my own country. Okay, what does that mean? That means that a child growing up who can have a teacher hit him or her has presumably a very sense of violence, um, the use of violence, than a child who grows up in a state that doesn't have that. Um, in Kenya, the uh, country I've already mentioned, um, until quite recently, it was legal for teachers to hit um, their children. And punishment, physical punishment, is part of many cultures sense of how you adjust norms, how you deal with right and wrong. So when we think about this notion of can a child be innocent for, let's say, being violent, it depends on the cultural lens about that. Um, and here's where I think the science has, is very illuminating. Um, we know, for example, when children are abused physically, sexually, or emotionally, what that does to the developing brain is it creates a system which is on high alert 24 seven. And if you think about prey um, on the savanna, a gazelle, um, if I see an, a lion attack my group, um, my conclusion isn't that lion is dangerous. My conclusion is that all lions are dangerous. And for the developing child has been abused by a parent, which is the ultimate love and attachment that any child expects that's just that code. And now either you flee or you fight back. And that's what we see with children in school often is that those children who have been developing in an environment where the safety notion is out the window, they now develop a mentality, which is to fight back often. And so that notion of innocence, coming back to your important question, is tinted by the fact that their experience has shaped a much more trigger happy, violent response, which is often an adaptive response to someone who's bigger and stronger than you. Mark, the subtitle, as I said, of the new book, um, uh, Vulnerable Minds, The Harm of, trial, of Childhood Trauma and the Hope of Resilience. Again, you don't need me to tell you this. The word trauma is also enormously controversial these days. It seems <laughs> to be used in all sorts of contexts by all sorts of people you know and, and some cultural critics would suggest that this snowflake generation treats everything a rejected job application a bad romance as as trauma how would you define this word and is this a word that also has changed historically yes so uh, another great question i the the word trauma in a clinical sense, really grew out in kind of the 60s in psychiatry, um, dealing with veterans of war who came back and showed all sorts of challenges with invasive, you know, nightmares and dissociation of who they were and agitation and so forth. And the word of those experiences of individuals who had been exposed to horrific things. And it became part of kind of, you know, the clinical's Bible, the, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health, um, as well as the international classification, you know, these two different um, books that really 
are about clinical cases. Um, and it was about a specific kind of response to either committing violence or being exposed to violence and the kind of scarring that happens to the body and brain. That's where the sort of the origins, the etymology of trauma comes from. But you, as you kind of astutely noted, um, the word trauma has become part of our vernacular. And in fact, as you kind of introduced the show, so too have many other clinical diagnoses like depression and anxiety. I think one of the biggest hashtags on uh, TikTok is hashtag bipolar. And tons of the kids that I interact with in schools are now self-diagnosing. And so this is a real problem. Um, but the problem goes further because the word trauma um, clinically, when it's used by trained clinicians, has often served um, for this exposure to violence, either domestic violence, community violence, physical abuse, sexual abuse, which are certainly ways in which trauma can manifest itself. But when you think about trauma as a scarring to the body and brain, one of the things that has emerged over the past few years is that there are different traumatic signatures depending upon the type of adversity that was experienced, when it occurred, how long, how toxic it was, and so forth. These are what I refer to in my book as kind of the dimensions um, of adverse experiences. And it's really important to understand that because by identifying these traumatic signatures that are linked to these different dimensions, we are much better able to help individuals recover from them. So it's like individual treatment based on those signatures, the way that if you had a certain blood type, you would do something that's different than if you had a different blood type. So what the science is, is really beginning to articulate beautifully and hopefully is that different dimensions of adversity shape different traumatic signatures, and that's how we can help people recover. So you, you talked about recovering trauma, uh, and, and the book is about childhood trauma, vulnerable minds, but you mentioned also people coming back from war and experiencing trauma, whether it was Vietnam or the First World War or one of the Gulf Wars. Is adult trauma, Mark, less, shall we say, plastic than childhood trauma? Is the nature of tra childhood trauma, if you experience it in the quote unquote innocence of childhood is it more plastic is there more potential for recovery absolutely so the developing brain um, is a much more changing brain uh, than the adult brain um, and i'll say two things about that one is there are certain periods even within that are more plastic than others, if we think within childhood. So for example, puberty is a period of kind of effervescence in terms of the plasticity of the brain. The hormones are creating kind of a rebirth of plasticity. And so it's an opportunity for change if there's been a history of traumatic experiences before. On the other hand, it's also a period because of that plasticity where greater harm can occur. Things that many of your listeners may be intimately familiar with is that during COVID, when people were socially isolated, the people who suffered the most were teenagers. And that's because the teenage years are a period that are often referred to as a critical period. This window of opportunity where if social interactions don't occur, it's like depriving a baby of milk. They absolutely mm -hmm. need that social interaction to thrive. And what we are seeing globally is that that teenage group is now much more socially immature because they were deprived. On the other end, the early ages, those first few years of life are when those frontal lobes are truly growing. And all the circuitry that's enabling children to learn and make decisions and control things if you were deprived in those early ages, from birth to five, you see the of delay later in life. Some maybe not even recoverable. Okay, so there's no question there's even plasticity differences within child development. But once you hit that adult stage, let's say after the age of 25, when the frontal lobe is matured, you now have much greater difficulty 
making changes. This is where, by the way, and if for readers who are interested, sort of the last part of my book opens up even new hope for adults. The last chapter of the book is called Neuroengineering, and it really gets into things like psychedelics and stimulation of the brain that can really cause change in adults. And in fact, many of these methods are only applicable at this point in time for adults. But the revolution in psychedelics, which is just beginning to happen in some ways, I mean, it's been happening, but the science is growing and growing with great strength, provides hope for adults who have been treatment resistant for years, people with major depression, PTSD, some of these therapy assisted psychedelic treatments are showing massive recovery for some of these individuals. It is one of the most hopeful discoveries for me in the last decade, at least from the sciences. Brave new world indeed. Of course, uh, he will. Uh, Huxley warned us in some ways when he <laughs> was into psychedelics himself. We've done a number of shows on it. We're speaking with Mark D. Hauser, uh, author of an important new book, Vulnerable Minds, The Harm of Childhood Trauma and the Hope of Resilience. After the break, I want to come back and talk more specifically about this childhood trauma in the world today. He's a much traveled man, not just in the United States, but around the globe. I want to remind everyone that High quality guests, intelligent guests like Mark Hauser, who bring very different kinds of perspectives, are brought to you with the help of our friends at Liberties, a quarterly journal of culture and politics. Excellent new publication. Going to run a short feature, and then we'll be back with Mark Hauser to talk more about vulnerable minds. So don't go away, anyone. We'll be back in a second. The news, the noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties, it's not just a journal of ideas. It's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens. Politics, opinion, substance. Liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought. A quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight, of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller. And you can subscribe to Liberties at libertiesjournal.com. We're speaking with Mark D. Hauser, the author of Vulnerable Minds, an important new book about childhood trauma. The subtitle is The, the Harm of Childhood Trauma and the Hope of Resilience. Uh, Mark, first part of our conversation, you talked about something called adverse childhood experiences, known in your trade as ACE. Um, firstly, and we sort of touched on this in the first part, maybe briefly define that and also perhaps quantify it. I know you think, or you at least suggest in the book, there are up to a billion children now or people uh, suffering from ACE in the world today. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in 1998, uh, a really important publication came forward from Dr. Vincent Felitti, who, was a prevent who is a preventive medicine doctor. And what it was based on was a questionnaire, a 10 question questionnaire um, that asked adults um, whether they experienced any of the following 10 different types of adverse child experiences from birth to the age of 18. Um, so in one category were aspects of neglect or deprivation. Uh, emotional or physical uh, de neglect. Um, then there was abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse. And then another kind of cloud or category, what was called family dysfunction, uh, a parent with mental health issues, divorce or separation, uh, incarceration of a parent, substance abuse by a parent, or domestic violence. So 10 questions, and quite simply, did you or did you not have any of these? Um, so you took a survey and at the end of the survey, you got a score zero to 10. At the same time that they collected this information, which from about 17,000 individuals in Southern California, they were also getting uh, a whole bunch of health information because these were individuals who were coming in for physical checkups and a part of that checkup, they got, you know, the survey. Um, what Felidi and his colleagues found really sent a shock wave through the medical community. And specifically, what they found was the higher the number of ACEs, the greater the risk of major health problems, physical and mental health, 
disease, cancer, uh, suicidal ideation, substance abuse, um, all these big, big health risks. So when this was published, um, the World Health Organization very quickly um, started to disseminate the survey globally, um, and it was changed in certain ways. And lo and behold, and somewhat not surprisingly, ACEs were not the province of people in Southern California. They were happening all over the United States. More importantly, they were happening in low-income countries, high-income countries, democracies, you know, dictatorships, uh, religious, not religious. There seemed to be no key demographic factor that would say this is a population that doesn't have ACEs. It was super important because what it indicated, it, particularly in the medical area, was that doctors were not at childhood adversity. Felitti himself, who was running an obesity clinic, had never bothered to ask about childhood adversity or think about how that might impact subsequent health risks. Okay, so that's adverse childhood experiences. Uh, in many areas, people are aware of that idea of adverse childhood experiences. It appears in certain education areas. Some nurses may know, doctors and so forth, but it's not that well known. But more importantly, it's led in some ways to a kind of a simplistic view of adverse childhood experiences, and it's gotten confused with the response. Many people have falsely interpreted the adverse childhood experiences as a response, but it's not. It's simply the experience. The response can either be traumatic or resilient. So I make a distinction between traumatic responses to ACEs or traces and resilient responses to ACEs or races. It's important that we look at both because some individuals exposed to the same types of adversity will respond traumatically, meaning showing some kind of scarring to the body and brain whereas others will not. They will bounce right back from it. Furthermore, there are other important dimensions. How often did it occur? When during development did it occur? Did the child have any control over it? Was it a completely turbulent, chaotic environment? By taking into account these different dimensions, those shape the potential response. And that's why the ACE score is a potentially misleading piece of information on a vacation. Moreover, and this is really important, the original survey was never designed as a screening tool for the individual. ACEs as a survey was a population measure in the same way that heritability is a population measure. We don't say this is your heritability, Andrew, or this is your ACE score, Andrew. And that's really important because in certain parts of the world, for example, California, the ACE score is being used by insurance companies to determine treatment. And that's potentially very dangerous for the two reasons I mentioned. It's not a screener for the individual. Some individuals with ACEs don't receive trauma. Mark, uh, we, we touched on the differences between the US and the rest of the world in the US Constitution. There's pride of place to the promise of happiness. How much of the argument in your book is bound up in this idea of happiness? Um, I want to talk a little bit more about resilience later, but if we can get beyond trauma, can we be happy? Does trauma equal unhappiness or is that the wrong way of thinking about it? Oh, I love that question. Um, so one of the things that's grown out of the science um, of adverse childhood experiences is that often in a response to adversity, including trauma, are what the psychologist Bruce Ellis calls hidden talents. That from adversity, children can emerge with certain kinds of skills that are actually above and beyond what people without such adversities have, have, have experienced. And I think also importantly here, and this goes back to the beginning um, of your introduction, um, is that as many uh, people are currently discussing that there's a generation of kids now in various Western countries, I think in particular, who have coddled the children and protected them so that they have no grit 
in character to fight back, no resilience in themselves because they've got no skills to do that. They've been enveloped in this loving you know, environment in some sense, which is the wonderful part about it, but it's led to children who have less ability to cope with difficulty. Um, so that's one piece. Um, trauma, if you stick with the clinical definition, certainly does not equal happiness because it's really a scarring to the body and the brain. And one way I, which I want to really focus here is that we have to be very careful not to interpret that someone who looks okay is actually okay in their underlying kind of biology. And I think one of the most kind of salient examples that I assume many of your listeners will be familiar with is the story of Sinead O'Connor, who died recently. Um, if you, I encourage everybody to go back and look at a picture of her when she was a teenager and just beginning to be kind of famous for her music. She's sparkling, her eyes are alive, alert, completely beautiful face. As she mentions in her autobiography, she was being abused by her mother to no end. So what looks okay on the surface is often covering up what's bad underneath. So I think we have to make sure that people who look like they're making it through difficult times are actually suffering underneath. So trauma in that clinical sense only does not equal happy. On the other hand, if we are constantly protective of individuals, we're not helping them either. And that's why one of the important messages in the book is that we clearly need to focus on different strategies to help people recover from trauma, what I call the trauma toolkit. But equally, we need to build up resilience so that individuals can face adversity. I'm thinking here today of the children who are currently being exposed to wars in Ukraine and Gaza, right? So science, in fact, some of the most beautiful science conducted by Ruth Feldman, who's an Israeli neurobiologist, comes from work in the Gaza. And seemingly and extremely sadly for me that when I was writing my book, the open chapter of war is about Gaza in 2021. And so my book comes out in 2024. And here we have a situation which repeats itself. What that science shows is that exposure to war effectively knocks out the system of empathy, of caring for others, of being able to see someone else's misery and understand it from your perspective. If that's the case, we really, really need to be equipping children with skills to deal with adversity because it's unlikely that the landscape of adversity is ever going to go away. And so other than coddle, we need to be giving kids the skills to defend themselves, to deal with adversity, and not have them live in a bubble. Yeah, we had the co-author of Coddling of the American Mind on the show a few months ago. You mentioned uh, Shanad O'Connor, of course, a, a female uh music star there's a new movie coming out about amy winehouse another sad narrative we've talked about cultural yes. differences in trauma and children mark what about gendered ones how do you analyze yeah. that do, do boys and girls experience i mean obviously you have the, the sexual element and rape which in some ways women are more vulnerable than men although not entirely but do women and females and males, do they experience trauma differently? Yes. So um, I'll, I'll share with you kind of an interesting study that will shape this. So there's been some recent work on um, children who were kind of in utero uh, during Hurricane Sandy, one of the biggest storms to hit the East Coast of the United States, you know, several years ago. And they were able to compare uh, children who were kind of um, in utero kind of before the, the storm and were kind of born, you know, during it to those who were kind of, you know, in the womb uh, with mom during Hurricane Sandy. And then they followed them for five years after that. Um, the result is striking. So this is the impact of stress on the mother to the and what you find are very striking sex differences. So at the age of five, these children who did not experience adversity for the first five years of their lives postnatally, 
At the age of five, the girls showed highly significant problems with depression and anxiety. In other words, internalized health problems. The boys showed much more in terms of externalized behavior, oppositional, aggression, and so forth. So the general kind of rule of thumb, again, these are sex differences, they're statistical ones, with obviously some overlap, <laughs> is that girls typically tend to internalize the adversity more, showing up as mental health issues such as depression and anxiety. Boys tend much more to externalize. So boys, for example, had a significantly higher rate of attention disorder deficit. Obviously, it's internally generated, but it's showing up as attentional problems. The girls tended to retract, show much more depression and anxiety. So again, as a general rule of thumb, that's the experience you have. Um, sexual abuse is an interesting one, of course, because boys are certainly not immune to that. Um, you get certainly some differences in emotional response to that, which I discuss in the book. You get some very specific effects um, on girls in terms of actually their neuroanatomy. It's truly striking amazing study that was done out of Germany where they looked at um, girls who had been sexually abused kind of before puberty. Um, and there's a particular area of the brain, which is kind of a map of our body parts. And some will know this as the homunculus, but the simple idea is that more innervation there is to our body parts, like our lips and our fingers, the bigger the space is in the brain. What they found is that for girls who had been sexually abused before or the area that's associated with the clitoris was much smaller. And so we see these, again, these signatures that are showing up. Now, that hasn't yet been done with boys, so maybe there's something similar in the general area. But the key idea is that you're seeing these effects of different kinds of adversity. And again, the general rule of thumb is the girls typically are more likely to internalize the problem and the boys are internalized the problem. Fascinating, Mark. A final question. There's a lot more we could talk about, but we need to end the show. Um, now, all sorts of communities listening to this. There's obviously parents, there's policymakers, there's educators, there's the medical community. Very briefly, what um, what is the message in the book to these different communities? So the way I kind of put it in the book is it's really a cry to arms for a collaborative effort because children like this, such as the children I work with um, in schools uh, or the orphanages in Kenya, um, really needs a real team to have different skill sets. It requires doctors and nurses who are dealing with the actual physical issues, health issues that come out of this. Stress often results in gastrointestinal problems. So we need doctors. We need teachers because these children are in schools and they're often showing behaviors which are really disrupting their own learning and the learning of others. So we need schools that are trauma informed. We need social workers and policy workers and the law enforcement to understand and recognize these signatures so that when they see a child, who's got these kinds of issues, they can help in that particular way. So it's really gonna require a collaboration among the experts, as well as a recognition among parents and communities of the ways in which certain kinds of adversity can undermine attachment, social growth, and cognitive growth. So it's a combination and the literature is there. It, the reason why I wrote the book is to give people a handle on what's going on in a way that I hope is digestible to the diversity of people who need to care.